So what software do you use here to uh, to edit the show? Is it? Well, we're still using Final Cut Pro 7 at the moment because yeah. we, I, mean, I started on Final Cut Pro 1 when it came out and went all the way through to 7. But the fact that Final Cut Pro are not updating it, I, I, I can, we can do it on X, but I don't like it. So we might go to Premiere. Right. Um, but at the moment, 7 still works and all our templates are on. Uh, what's the process with working with Russia today? Do you, they just, you... IFTP the show when it's done um, to their server yeah. in Moscow. So as soon as the show's done um, here. So if this was for broadcast tomorrow, which this one isn't, uh, mm -hmm. but say on a Monday when we come in, we'll record Tuesday's episode. As soon as we've done it, I will come in, put all the graphics on it, chop it down to exactly 26 minutes, yeah. export it, and then upload it to... Russia Today's server. And do Russia Today ever come back to you with any editorial? Never any editorial. Um, pressure or anything They like that. occasionally cut bits out if, you know, really? Max has been swearing or whatever or something yeah. like that. I'll, I'll tend to bleep any obvious swearing. Yeah. But they, uh, they've never sent me a list of all the words they don't like. No. Occasionally words that I think are acceptable. They don't, so yeah. they have the right to, to snip. But you've never thought out. they were trying to adapt, you know, modify, no. No, 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 no. We, we, That's good. We, we never get any editorial input. I mean, you need to ask Stacey. Uh, well, I've never had any. I, yeah. We, they let us do our own thing. Yeah, we, yeah, we yeah. We do the reports. As long as we don't do anything libelous. Yeah. You know, stay within the um, regulations. Yeah. He looks in town, um, whatever the colour is, I guess that's because... You wouldn't know. They don't have a colour for that here in Britain. <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, it's just white. Ghost-like, or, or red. We do red quite well oh, yes, when we go true. abroad. Red. I say we, we do red. You mean strawberry, actually. Yeah, well, it's nothing, sure. No. Scott, you'll see the Scots, though. You Sometimes. do vomit well. Nothing healthy. <laughs> you never hear someone say, oh, what a healthy shade of tan. No, that's never said in these aisles. And then they have to go to some other aisles, like Bermuda. Yeah, that's why we started the colonies in the first place. That's what they, the first fake tanning in this country was actually rubbing Marmite on their face. <laughs> they try to make it look like they had gone to some foreign country, other than this druid swelling marmite puking, you love it really cloud <laughs> worshiping. He thinks you protest too much. Yeah, <laughs> we're <you're> protesting. <laughs> it's more of love. Well, you, didn't put, you didn't put my thing on already. What's going on here, man? Thanks for poking me in the eye. <laughs> it was your cheek, man. man. It was I your natural cheek. Right. It was passive your aggressive. <laughs> it was your cheek. <laughs> On that screen, I look all like, you know, one thing. I like blend in with the chair. I look like a human chair. Really? Yeah. Huh. You at communist. Human chair? Like you should auction me up. Flash fund. Use me as a flash fund to start doing. It's 
top of the Rodali. The Stacy human chair. The human chair. The human Stacy chair. Well, um, you just got your million dollars on the Bank to the Future. That's right, the Bank to the Future money raise for the Bitcoin Capital Crypto Fund has been successful. We're over a million. Uh, we still have a week to go, mm -hmm. so we don't know where that's going to top out, but there, there'll be more like this coming. Well, I've heard you say that it's the purpose of it, perhaps amongst other things, but the main purpose of it is to destroy banksters. Mm. So can you explain how that's going to work? Well, the banksters occupy uh, a vast territory of the, of the global economy using fiat currency is pretty much the means by which they are, have been able to conquer uh, vast territories around the world and commoditize and privatize and financialize. So cryptocurrencies, it's about the public domain. It's a public domain, so the public domain pushing back against the private domain, against the bankster domain. So the bigger we make this, this wild area of cryptocurrency, like plants, like planting trees, you know, to increase the amount of wild forest there are in the world, uh, the less territory there is for banksters to operate. So the bigger we get, the smaller they get. It's a zero-sum game, basically. In that world of uh, of banking, it's competitive, it's ruthless, and it's that's the focus. It's about competition. It's not about cooperation. So, isn't that in a way playing? in their terms, if you like, playing the game in their terms a bit of competition and of, 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 of battle, if you like, rather than the focus being on cooperation, the focus needs to be on competition. Yeah, absolutely. The, the battle is, uh, we, we're going to the battlefield, mm. to battle. Uh, my problem that I have most with most activists and others, folks who are fighting back against bankers, etc., is that they, were, they are unwilling to get onto the battlefield. They want to stand back and they want to criticize and they want to offer you know, solutions, they want to offer uh, theories, they want to offer ideas and ideals and ideas like compassionate capitalism, for example, is an idea that sounds great, but you know, you, you have to actually go onto the pitch, you have to go onto the battlefield and do battle where the battle is. You can't yeah. just sit in the sidelines and say, you know, be a critic, like, oh, you're terrible, you know, and then not, not be willing to get your you know, your, your hands dirty and actually go to battle with these guys. I don't know, did uh, Scott fall asleep again? We're in like some purgatory, it's like fucked up. How do you feel about nonviolence as a, a tactic for revolution? I think it's great. It, well, you know, you, I see what you're saying, but it needs to have a, a vehicle, it needs to be applied, it can't just be an idea. It needs well, to a, a, the hedge fund is not a violent fund. No, no. So there's, it is a nonviolent tactic. You know, all the things that I talk about, whether it's Karma Bank, this Bitcoin Capital, Start Join, Start Coin, these are all nonviolent, and they're all meant to do battle with the forces that are corrupting much of the global economy and ecology. Yes. Um, Let me just point out quickly that I saw something in Iceland that I thought was very interesting. So there, uh, there's a motion in Iceland to go after bankers for counterfeiting because they're saying that the whole fractional reserve banking system is inherently a counterfeiting scheme, which it is. And um, that's extraordinary. Uh, and I think other activists around the world should pick up on that because they understand, and go do, use the same tactic in England against the Bank of England because essentially fractional reserve banking is counterfeiting supplied by the Bank of England. The banks in New York are counterfeiting through fractional reserve banking and they're supplied by the Federal Reserve Bank. So this, this notion of counterfeiting, which I remember I did something on Al Jazeera maybe four or five years ago, which was my last appearance on Al Jazeera actually. I was screaming that these banks are counterfeiting. You have to look at it as counterfeiting. Uh, and then I, I think I said somebody should declare a fatwa against um, Hank Paulson and they got upset about that. But. <laughs> So, for perhaps for some of the less tech savvy of us, it, can you define how the difference between a counterfeit currency and a real currency? Well, in this instance, you have an obvious comparison to make with gold. Whether you like gold or not, it's a good it's a good way to illustrate this point. There is a uh, set amount of gold in the world, and during the 19th century, actually, the world was on a gold standard, did very well, and um, you can't counterfeit gold. So people it held people to account. Uh, if you were uh, in arrears, if you were an accounting deficit, if you, you know, you'd have to sell your gold, if you have to buy your gold, there's, it's a zero-sum game, essentially, and it kept people honest to a large degree, uh, much more than we have today, which is a counterfeiting scheme where 
any central bank that feels like they want to pay fines or make the balance sheet look better or massage their their export uh, numbers, import numbers, they just print more money, which is which is counterfeiting. So they just use it to, to as any counterfeiter would do, uh, to buy goods and services illicitly, to uh, make their balance sheets look healthy when they're not. Uh, so that's the main difference is you can't print gold, you can print a fiat currency, which can be counterfeited, it is counterfeited, as Iceland has said, it is a counterfeiting scheme, uh, whereas gold or cryptocurrency would be the opposite of that. You can't you can't have a counterfeiting scheme or a Ponzi scheme if you're using crypto or gold. Well, all the momentum I had 25 seconds ago is gone. Thanks, thanks uh, Scott. He's turned this into a real chore now. He's not even there. Why you, Chris, so you're talking to me? Uh, guys, the problem is I can't really hear you yet. So JoJo's got some issues with the audio. Once he's fixed those, we'll be ready Chris, to go. Chris, there. Oh, oh, this, this, this is the one day of heat wave for the UK for this year. This is the heat wave. Right, so it's going to give you a different mic. Oh, motherfucker! So I was some bullshit with JoJo. Well, there's been a gig in here. He's trying to justify his pay. Well, if I don't do this, people think that work is too easy. I always think it's too easy. It's good for me, though. This is all behind the scenes that guys report gold for me. Is it? Okay, I'm glad you're happy. We've been doing some collaborations with uh, the Trues and, and Russell Brand and, to, and with some wonderful results. Uh, but I noticed the other day you mentioned that Russell appears to have caused the True Boycott Hedge Fund. Where's this, where's this going? How, how are we going to convince him to, to come out to this? And to <laughs> this, is, uh, this is the same. For, this, I've had this experience before. I talked to Greenpeace. I talked to The Ecologist magazine with Zach Goldsmith. I've talked to... Russell Brand. I even mentioned it to the Zeitgeist fellow, Peter Joseph. Uh, and I talked to David DeGraw. Um, what happens is that conceptually people understand this is a fantastic idea. But then when it comes time to actually put it in motion, they have the realization that you're going to step onto the battlefield and you could get hurt yeah. for real. And they, nobody has taken that step. Nobody has taken the step yet. Uh, to actually step onto the battlefield and do battle with these guys on, in their own t on their own turf. Mm -hmm. So uh, the same thing with Russell. We we were on the one yard line, and then they hit the pause button. Uh, you know, realizing suddenly that wait a minute, this would bring down the wrath of mm -hmm. the entire establishment, and so we have to weigh those consequences against the any possible benefits. And like it, I've seen uh, now half a dozen times already, it, it's, it's, it's stuck in a state of limbo. On the boycott side of things, as you know, the fund works by monetizing boycotts mm -hmm. and comparing that with short sales through a, through a fund, a hedge fund. Yeah. I, I see that the global activist community is waking up to the fact that they have enormous economies of scale. There's millions of activists, there's 10,000 NGOs, mm -hmm. that they are focused on Monsanto yeah. as being a single global campaign for one company. So they're waking up to the fact that it makes no sense to having different NGOs and different activist groups be boycotting and doing campaigns against different companies yeah. because there's no economies of scale to that. So they have finally, after almost 10 years of me prodding the global activist community, they've now coming around to this idea that we should just focus on one at a time because we'd have success poss possibility. Okay, so now they've finally got to that point. So uh, maybe next year or the year after, they'll, they'll f the rest of the equation will kick in and they'll say, oh, you know what, if we did what Max has been saying with this hedge fund, we could move billions, hundreds of billions of dollars away from the bad guys and into the pockets of the good guys. And but it's going to be animal farm because all the good guys are going to get all the money and then they're going to become the bad guys because the value system at base is distorted. No, because in fact, we're incentivizing some of the bad guys to be bad. This is the beauty of this concept, is that when the hedge fund launches, and let's say you go after, not Monsanto, because not, Monsanto's not a good candidate for this in particular, but we'll use Monsanto as, as an example. So you have the global activist community go after Monsanto, let's say boycott Monsanto, although it's not a good company to boycott. Then the fund is poised to make money as the shares go down in value, because we're making negative bets against the share price. Other hedge funds out there, they would glom on to what we're doing to make money for themselves. Yeah. But that's great because what we're doing is we're taking the boycott, which has, on its own right, not much leverage. If I go and I boycott a company um, and, I, and I do it without much strategic thought, 
I'm not really making a huge impact on, a, on that company because that company can counterfeit more money to do a few things. They can buy back their own stock with counterfeited money. They can raise their dividend using counterfeited money. Or they can increase their marketing campaign to, uh, with counterfeited money. So it's very difficult to get any traction. It's very difficult to get leverage. But if I do a pointed boycott against a global campaign with one company that's vulnerable to a boycott, so Monsanto wouldn't be vulnerable, but a Coca-Cola or a McDonald's or a Starbucks. But if you stick to one company like this, now you've got some leverage. Now you've got economies of scale. Now you're actually going to start to erode the revenues of that company. How do you make that leverage even greater? Well, invite the entire hedge fund community to, to do what you're doing. So you're leveraging their greed. You're leveraging their badness to, to help you expand the public domain. And where that money goes in our fund is completely transparent, put it on the blockchain, you know exactly where it's going, and the um, room for fraud and malfeasance would be zero. And so that's, that's one of the beauties of this, is that you're actually using the worst elements of the hedge fund community and you're, you're co-opting that yeah. in a way to create leverage to move <coughs> huge amounts of cash in, into a new direction. What's going on? Is this thing going to happen or what? He's given up. He's still fiddling around with his microphone. No way. He is. Wait. What's the matter? You've only done one part. So somebody else used this studio Wait. and messed it up? That's all I can say. Not there, mate. This is our studio. But yeah, they've come in and they've rewired everything. The judges have just noticed. Oh, what? Did something happen? Oh. Let me just get this. Uh, oh, 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 oh. Why am I sitting here? Why am I sitting here? Would you like to go and take a walk? Why am I wasting my time? We don't, we, don't, we don't have a situation where everyone can, people such as yourself, Russell Brand, Peter Joseph, you can cooperate to a degree, but it's, it's I don't know how it's going to come to pass that there's going to be enough of a degree of cooperation where these things can simultaneously and interlink and, and have working together and they can get credibility because people on the outside can see that we're able to work with each other. Well, you're know. describing a problem of incentives. Mm -hmm. So what are the incentives for people to work together? What are the incentives for people to take these actions at all? And the, these incentives are thwarted by the counterfeiters. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the folks, uh, for example, who have been on the cusp of doing the boycott hedge fund idea, the incentives problem kicks in. The crisis, as you describe it, I mean, the most obvious crisis to me and the easiest one to point at would be the ecological crisis. Yeah. You have the planet is now rejecting its 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 human um, you know inhabitants. Yeah, that's it, that um, so but <clears throat> even though in Texas there's huge floods and California is going through a thousand year drought and people migrants are gonna have to leave. There's still people are incentivized to have cognitive dissonance, to reinforce their biases, to let their egos talk you know, convince them that what they what their eyes see is wrong. So those there's not enough of an incentive. So unfortunately, history tells us that people are not truly incentivized until there is until the wolf is at the door, until uh, their their kids are starving to death in in a country like in Britain, uh, which has already a problem of poverty and starvation in many cases, near starvation. It's still not making the nightly news, but so. Yeah. And, and, and as long as it doesn't really hit a critical percentage of the population, the counterfeiters can just counterfeit enough money to buy more media exposure to push their propaganda. They can buy more bond purchases to drive a real estate bubble, which in this country, everyone, no matter what you tell them, they'll, they're, they're, when they're back of their mind, the only thing they're thinking about is their house prices. So you can say, hey, guess what? Your wife is being raped by a gang down the block, your dog's on fire and your kids are on smack. And the guy's like, okay, how does this affect my house price? Is my house price, is it going up? Is it going up? Okay, that's, that's fine, that's the first thing. Now, what'd you say, my wife, what? Huh, kids? I didn't even know I had kids, huh? So that's, that's an amazingly powerful way to get people to get confused about their incentives. They think that house price appreciation is, is more important than God, country, soul, society you know as margaret thatcher said there is no society and she engineered that mm. propaganda by we're now in a 28 year bull market in bonds that means for 28 years every stupid thing governments have done 
has been washed away with counterfeiting, which is what the same thing as, as the bond market rally is a rally in counterfeiting. It's been going for 28 years. You have people who were born, you know, uh, they have like two generations now that are completely misinformed about how markets can behave. I mean, when the, when the bull market's over and interest rates around the world start going up in earnest, and suddenly, instead of house prices going up every single year, they go down every single year. Instead of stocks and bonds going up every single year, they go down every single year, not just for one year or two years, but for five years, 10 years, 15 years, then it's a completely different mindset. And then people, their incentives are different. Like, well, I can do this boycott hedge fund and maybe eat tonight, yeah. or I can ignore it and definitely starve. <laughs> So unfortunately, people are like that, and and I mean, I I probably will probably be gone before actually someone actually does this. It, it'll be the years will pass, but I hope some they remember that I had this idea at a, in a timely way, and you all fucked up. <laughs> we have more extra days. Yeah, we're we're recording Monday and Tuesday. What? It's too so complicated. It it's too complicated for your little mind. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it gives you like, where's your first floating stuff? Are we going on a trip? That's what I was wondering. We could do. We, we have... Is it possible, going on a more philosophical tack here, that there's sort of a counterfeit notion at the base of all of this, which is private property? The, the idea that you can be, the idea that you can own private property, and that is a rational concept because it's clear that you can take possession of something. You can be in possession of some goods or. <coughs> or a, or a, a domicile. <coughs> yeah, I mean, I philosophically, the idea of private property doesn't fit with the huge history of humans. Mm. It's private property is something that's uh, a new concept. It's only 10, 12,000 years old. It comes from agriculturalism, agricultural society, and then suddenly people living quite concentrated together. And to make that work, you create the, the, the political unit society, the state, and so to make that run, you have a tension between government, which is supposed to be running the, the public's property, and private enterprise, which is running the private property within that society, and tapping into the entrepreneurialism that is, is a good a key factor. This is where I'm, I split with folks that believe in collectivism is the way to go which is, it, 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 you take away that entrepreneurialism, which is needed to keep your male population from going insane. Without entrepreneurial possibilities, men become nuts, and then they act out, and they become violent. So you need a way for men to, to think like, you know what, I'm going to try to just jump off this cliff and see if I fly. And, of course, many of them die. But then somebody says, wait a minute, let's build a wing. And, you know, you, men have to have that in their brains as a possibility. Otherwise, they just say, you know what, I'm so sick of this boring shit. I'm going to start mass murdering people. And you see that all the time. They're just boring. They're bored to death. They're bored into serial killing. So, uh, you know, entrepreneurialism is, is there. But it, but it can't, be let, you can't be allowed to run wild, run amok. So there needs to be, the balance is between state and private property. It's not between having private property and no private property, uh, especially now with the population of 7 billion going to 8 billion, 9 billion people on planet Earth, you, you need to organize that flow of, of people, and, and they're moving around, they're on transportation networks, they're getting educated, they're doing lots and lots of stuff, so I don't think it's the, the tension, the question is not between private property versus not having private property, uh, you know, unless you, because if the planet graduated from that 10,000 years ago when we went from hunter-gatherers to domesticated villages. That was the beginning of private property. And we're not going to go back to hunter-gatherers because there's not enough room for that. You can't have 8 million people in London decide they're going to just go and hunt buffalo, you know, down in Cornwall. You know, it just, it doesn't, it just, the, the, the topography of the, of the globe and the, 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 the nature of the, the reality we live in, this never, you're never going to have go back to that. So you end up with public versus private, government versus private. And the anarcho-capitalists out there say, oh, markets are perfect, markets are flawless, you don't need a government, just let the market solve all problems. And that's been proven Not to be easy. completely false. Yeah. Markets are a great way to distribute risk and reward. Markets work perfectly if you're talking about you need to keep the population kind of at bay and under control. In that respect, they kind of do work perfectly because they funnel well, there's a wealth transfer. People like to trade, and that's been true for thousands of years. And when you trade, 
what has evolved from that is you need a, a medium of exchange. But it's like you always point out, it's fine to like to trade, but if you're trading a bunch of false, you know, counterfeit money, counterfeit money or false commodities, uh, yeah, <coughs> it, it, it's not good. And and trade works when it's kind of perhaps unique items, you know, art and things like that, and it's really the, the items that are being traded really have a meaning and a utility to people. Yeah. Well, that was fun when I woke up in uh, Budapest. Remember? 606500 is the only frequency they're using at the moment, Jojo. 6500. 606500. Yeah, I think, is it one of those? I think. Look at Radio 3. Oh, close. Yeah. Yeah. Right on it. Right on it, isn't it? This is fantastic. That's another brisk, lumpy little harmonic meaning. I just woke up and I had no idea what the fuck's going on. Right, I think we're good next one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just, uh, you must see. What a oh, big boy. tease. You have a. Uh, past on Wall Street as a banker, you behave ruthlessly. I personally, I mean, most people have behaved ruthlessly at some point in their life, especially with a, a cultural uh, <coughs> momentum that that leads you down that route of you better be ruthless, else you're not going to stay afloat. And <coughs> I think it takes some kind of event or some kind of revelation to steer people away from that ruthlessness. Uh, on, on an individual level, a person having a kind of a uh, Personal revolution, a revolution of the mind. Do you, do you have something that you can point to that happened in your life that made you go, I don't want to be ruthless anymore, or was it more of a kind of a, 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 a slow change? Or was it an oh, event? Uh, well, I think stuff. there's some self-preservation involved. Yeah. You know, you see right now yeah. in um, in the world there's a um, there's a plague, there's a um, of banker suicides, yeah. and because bankers are being forced to do things that are go against their nature as human beings. And a lot of them are choosing to kill themselves. So I think uh, at some point in my career, you really have to decide how ruthless do you want to be? Do you want to be ruthless to the point of losing your humanity, to, to the point where you might never ever get it back? Or do you want to step out and to go in a different direction? I think for me that happened in 1990 when I was traveling in Europe, I went to Paris and I thought that, you know, this is a place that's completely new to me, very interesting. And I'm just going to step out of the the world that I was in and go down this this different path. So, but uh, and I talked to Naomi Prince about this, who was a banker at Goldman Sachs, and I asked her. I said, you know, so many bankers are killing themselves because they hate what they do. Could have this been you? Uh, you mean you you quit in the middle of a huge bull market? Uh, do you ever think twice about that, or were you thinking like it's self-preservation? Because if I keep doing these things they're asking me to do, I could end up throwing myself off a building. Mm -hmm. She's like, yeah, I w that's exactly right. I didn't want to end up like these guys splattered on the sidewalk who are who've been asked to do things that they fundamentally can't do. Uh, yeah, I have a few words for you. Thank you. That's enough. <laughs> I don't want to hear the rest of the words you have for me. <laughs> Now, now I've got what day it is. Yeah, who knows? Yeah, I, I peaked like two minutes ago. <laughs> I left the show in the sheets. I already fucking... <laughs> I blew my show wide like two minutes ago. I don't think I can handle you know, I can't get up for the rest of it. I'm going to take a nap. Oh, man. This is tiring. It's hard work.